There is a tale about the Three Sisters Garden, and it is one that has been passed down through the centuries. There was once a family of a mother, father, and three sisters. The parents worked very hard to provide for the family, but constantly begged the daughters to help. They also had to stop them from arguing and fighting continually. The three sisters were different from each other and also unique, each in their own way. The eldest was tall and slender with long, silky, shiny hair. And the youngest was small but muscular and attractive. And the middle sister was average in height and looks but was beautiful in her giving nature. For whatever reason, although they loved one another very much, they could not get along. They would disagree on any little thing and be distracted from doing any work because of these quarrels. The parents tried and tried to get the sisters to help in the garden and help with the chores. When working together, they would always fight. When apart, they would complain about the others. The work wasn't getting done, and the parents were worried that if this kept up, they wouldn't make it through another winter. It was planning time, and the work had to be done. But as usual, the sisters were too busy fighting. The work wasn't getting done, and the parents were worried that if this kept up, that, as usual, the sisters would be spending all of the harvest fighting. So they needed help, and it was given to them. But not as they imagined. As the sister argued in the field, they were transformed into three plants. The first, a long, tall plant with silk tassels like hair. The second, a broad-leafed plant low to the ground. And the third, a medium-height plant with gentle vines. The plants, of course were corn, squash, and beans, the three sisters. The crops of corn, beans, and squash are known as the three sisters. For centuries, these three crops have been the center of Native American agriculture and culinary traditions. It is for good reason, as these three crops complement each other in the garden. Corn provides tall stalks for the beans to climb so that they are not outcompeted by sprawling squash vines. Beans provide nitrogen to fertilize the soil while also stabilizing the tall corn during heavy winds. Beans are nitrogen fixers, meaning they host rhizomes on their roots that can take nitrogen, a much needed plant nutrient from the air and convert it into forms that plant roots can absorb. The large leaves of squash plants shade the ground, which helps retain soil moisture and prevent weeds. These three crops are also at the center of culinary traditions and complement one another. A diet of corn, beans, and squash is complete and balanced. Regardless of how they are planted, these three crops are some of the most important for Native American peoples of the Southwest and other crops like tobacco, sunflowers, amaranth, and melons. It's strange to think that tobacco 
was a substance probably herb in the native days that was used in their rituals. Um, probably for the same reason that people grab a cigarette and watch it light and watch the smoke curl with their thoughts, so did the Native Americans use it in their ceremonies to connect with spirit. One major concern of the Southern Southwest is the hot, dry heat of the early summer. So corn in particular does not tolerate high heat and low humidity during the period of tasseling. Therefore, plant before April 15th to ensure that the pollen released during the corn's tasseling period, which is 30 to 70 days after planting, depending upon the variety, of course, will occur before June, early July, when it will be more likely to be sterile or infertile. Alternatively, plant in mid-late July with the summer monsoon season, and the corn will reach maturity when the temperatures drop a little and humidity rises. We recommend directly planting all of these three seeds as they will fare better than transplants. Direct planting of seeds leads to stronger root systems that are more adequately able to take up water, nutrients, resulting in more vigorous and healthy plants. Planting the three sisters in the order of corn, beans, and squash will ensure that they will grow and mature together and not grow at another sister's expense. Sister corn should be planted first so that she can grow tall above the other crops. Plant seeds for sister bean two, three weeks later, or at least when the corn is a few inches tall. And when the beans are sending out tendrils to climb the corn, it will be tall enough to support them. Plant sister squash seeds one week later after the beans have emerged. You don't want the large squash leaves to shade out young corn and bead seedlings before they have time to establish. The main consideration is your space constraints. It doesn't have to be a gigantic garden. It can be as small as a school yard garden, or it can be a balcony garden, or it can be your yard. You want corn, beans, and squash. That's it. And you can grow as much of it or as little of it for a fine example for growing beautiful vegetables in a Native American spirit for children in school. It would be half-baked to not discuss the symbolic meanings of beans, corns, and squash to the Hopi Indians. I also wanted to include how to incorporate a community garden in a way that works for everyone, as well as the meaning that would go behind it. In a, in a very similar pattern that the Hopi Indians would have done. So when we look at the symbolic meanings, the Hopi people were an indigenous tribe of the Southwestern United States and had a deep spiritual connection with nature and agriculture. The Three Sisters Garden is a very traditional agricultural practice among the Hopi and many other Native American tribes as well. The garden consists of three main crops of corn, which we spoke on, corn, beans, and squash, which are grown together also in a symbolic relationship. 
The spiritual meanings associated with the Hopi Three Sisters Garden are rooted in the Hopi worldview and their understanding of the interconnectedness of all living things and all beings. Here are some spiritual interpretations associated with each of the three crops. Corn. As much as many people want to not maybe give corn the benefit in their lives anymore as they used to, um, I think that it's gotten kind of a bad rap. But I think that we have to never forget that corn is the staple of thousands of years of agriculture or growing. It says corn holds great significance in the Hopi culture and is considered a sacred crop. It represents the substance and life force of the Hopi people. Corn symbolizes fertility, abundance, and the cycle of life and death. Its tall stalks are believed to provide a spiritual link between the earthly realm and the divine. Beans. Beans are seen as the mediators in the Three Sisters Garden. Beans are seen as the importance of community and cooperation. In the garden, the bean vines climb up the corn stalks, providing support and stability. Symbolically, beans signify the harmonious relationships between individuals and the need for cooperation and interdependence within the community. Squash represents protection and nourishment of the Hopi tradition. Its large leaves act as a natural mulch, preventing weeds and retaining moisture in the soil. Squash plants are spread out, covering the ground and providing shade, which helps in conserving water. Spiritually, squash symbolizes the importance of balance, sustainability, and protection. Together, the Three Sisters Garden embodies the principles of sustainability, cooperation, and interdependence, something we really badly need in this world now. It reflects the Hopi spiritual connection to the land, their respect for nature, and their understanding of the patterns of life. It is important to note that specific interpretations and practices may, of course, vary among different Hopi clans and individuals as spiritual beliefs, just like Lutheran, Catholic, and all of the ones that we practice in Christianity, can be deeply personal and cultural. How about community gardening with the Three Sisters Garden. Integrating a Three Sisters Garden into a community garden can bring historical significance, hoist workshops, informational sessions, or gardening classes to educate community members about the Native American agricultural tradition and the interdependence of corn, beans, and squash. Collaboration and planning 
involve community members in the planning process and encouraging them to share their ideas, preferences, and gardening expertise. Together, decide on the garden's layout, size, and location within the community garden. Design and implementation, incorporating the Three Sisters Garden design into the community garden layout. Traditionally, corn is planted in a mound or hill with beans winding their way up the corn stalks and squash planted around the base to provide ground cover. Ensure proper spacing and orientation to optimize plenty of sunlight exposure and growth. The variety selection means choosing suitable varieties of corn, beans, and squash that are well adapted to your region's climate and growing conditions. Consider selecting heirloom or local varieties to preserve biodiversity and cultural heritage. Maintenance and care encourage community members to take responsibility for the care of the Three Sisters Garden, developing a maintenance schedule and assigning specific tasks such as watering, weeding, and pest control to volunteers or interested gardeners within the community. Now, when I say pest controls, you know, praying mantis, ladybugs, Lots of insects eat the bugs that create problems in vegetables. <clears throat> it does not have to be chemicals at all. How about the harvest and sharing? Boy, that's an important one. When the crops are ready for harvest, Organize community events or harvest festivals to celebrate and share the abundance of the Three Sisters Garden. Encourage communal cooking, recipe exchanges, and potluck gatherings to foster a sense of community and cultural exchange. Environmental benefits highlight the environmental benefits of a Three Sisters garden by improving soil fertility, reducing the erosion, and natural pest control. Emphasize how this sustainable gardening approach contributes to a healthier ecosystem and supports bioadversity. The educational opportunities are vast when you do community gardening with the Three Sisters Garden. Use the Three Sisters Gardens as an educational resource for local schools, youth groups, or gardening clubs. Offer guided tours, workshops, or hands-on activities to teach about the interrelationships between plants and sustainable gardening practices. To seed, to save the seeds. I know around here in Iowa, people are so proud of their heritage seeds. So seed saving and sharing is important. Encourage community members to save, save the seeds Encourage the community members to save the seeds from the Three Sisters Garden for future plantings. Set up a seed library or exchange program within the community garden to promote seed diversity and self-sufficiency. Community engagement is all important in the Three Sisters Garden. Activities, involving community members and decision making, ongoing activities related to the Three Sisters Garden, 
create opportunities for collaboration, volunteerism, and social connections. Consider establishing a dedicated committee or working group responsible for the garden's maintenance and development. By integrating a three sisters garden into a community garden in a meaningful way, you can enhance the cultural appreciation, strengthen the community bonds, promote sustainable gardening practices, and provide educational opportunities for all involved. When I first heard about the Three Sisters Garden, I was fascinated first by just the name of it. But I think that as I read about it, I just realized how important it is to simplify. Yes, it's very simple, corn, beans, and squash. But the interconnectedness of watching it grow, planting appropriately, having a community also involved, as well as planting with the children in the backyard, um, it teaches how to take pride, how to have discipline, and how to have responsibility for living things, living gardens. And that's so important. We'll be right back with a Native American Medicine Circle Garden. And that's a really cool one also. Ohm Times TV. Hi, my name is Anne Marie O'Dell. And thank you for inviting me in for Tarot and Coffee. I offer 37 plus years of accurate, honest tarot channeling. Spirit comes through me as a feeling, an inner knowing. I call it the angel frequency. As you say your first name, I close my eyes and shuffle my well worn card as I go into a deep calm by phone, Skype, or Zoom. Contact me at the calling of light.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Own Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. I'm Anne Marie, and you are listening to Ohm Times Radio. And it is a new morning, and I wanted to start with a little story about how I got started with my interest in medicine wheel gardens. A long time ago, I had a very good friend who went into a, let's call it a judicial sabbatical. He sadly brought all of his Navajo ceremonial teepee poles that he needed a place for. We're talking about a teepee that is as big as my backyard. Unfortunately, there was no cover for it, so we set it up. And 
on that pole frame that was just amazing, I planted honeysuckle, morning glories, put a picnic table in it, and many children and grandchildren went into there and colored and uh, had an, a shady, beautiful environment in that huge Navajo ceremonial size tent. However, a tornado came. And as I was hunkering down in the basement, underneath mattresses, listening to the crashes and the poles being torn apart and whizzing through the air, I went outside and all that was left was this great big circle. For some reason, that circle is still a part of my life. I divided it into four sections, just like a pie. I didn't know why it was drawing me to doing that. And after that, I started reading about medicine wheel circles, their directional qualities, how they represent certain energies, herbs, flowers, the colors they represent. But I also learned that a medicine wheel garden doesn't have to be huge. A medicine wheel garden can be as small as a wagon wheel. A medicine wheel garden can be as big or small as you want it to be, but it is an amazing, wonderful encounter for your grandchildren or your children to be able to help create, build, and enjoy the benefits of. And to me, I will never forget when those poles were up in the honeysuckle in the morning glory and the bees that were so busy and, and watching my beautiful grandchildren in their uh, coloring. So today I wanted to discuss how you can create a medicine wheel garden introduce you to a book that I think will be very beneficial to you for it if you are creating one. And as you can see, I am very much into circles. I'm very much into dream catchers. Um, in my studio, outside my studio, uh, there's very Native American qualities about it. I may not be genetically Native American, but karmically, um, maybe gen in my DNA, of karmic DNA, I feel such an attachment, such a creative connection with the beauty, the, the artwork, the circles that I incorporate in everything. The Native American medicine wheel is a sacred symbol that many indigenous cultures across North America use, and it represents a holistic approach to life and encompasses various spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental teachings. While the medicine wheel has different interpretations among tribes, its directional meetings generally follow a similar pattern. And here is a common understanding of those directional meanings of the Native American medicine wheel. East. The east is associated with the rising sun and represents new beginnings, renewal, and the emotional element of air. It is often linked to the mental aspect symbolic knowledge, wisdom, and intellectual growth. The East also signifies the spring season, the time of birth, and new ideas. South. The South is associated with warmth of the midday sun and represents growth, vitality, and the element of fire. It symbolizes the emotional aspect, representing feelings, 
relationships, and passion. The South is also connected to the summer season, a time of abundance and expansion. That's right. West. The West is associated with the setting sun and represents endings, introspection, and the element of water. It symbolizes the spiritual aspect, encompassing inner knowledge, intuition, and transformation. The West is also linked to the autumn season, a time of harvest and reflection. North. The North is associated with the darkness of night and represents wisdom, guidance, and the element of earth. It symbolizes the physical aspect encompassing the body, health, and practical knowledge. The North is connected to the winter season and a time of rest, reflection, and preparation. If you are a tarot card reader, as I am, you will notice that also for me, when I read the cards, the East is represented or spring is represented by the wands. The warmth of the midday summer, growth, vitality, south, I associate with the card of cups. West is to me associated with, um, for me, the swords, because it is also a time where I want to get action done. I want to take care of things before it's harvest time. So the swords represents action and tarot. And so to me, the West or the, autumn, the summer autumn time represents the swords. And for me, the North or winter is represented as pentacles in a time frame of months. I just wanted to add that. So you've got your medicine wheel and the medicine wheel, like I said, can be um, divided into four sections as a huge circle surrounded by stones. If you want, it can be a wagon wheel as big wagon wheel that has wonderful sections in it that even though it's divided in four, you can plant the different colors, the different herbs, whatever you want. So the medicine wheel is often a circle divided into four quadrants, each representing one of the directions of north, south, east, and west. It guides personal and collective growth, emphasizing the interconnectedness of all aspects of life. In a Native American medicine wheel garden, the directional meanings are a sacred process, a sacred symbol used by the indigenous cultures and represents so many things to do with the spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental aspects. So if we look at the sacredness of your medicine wheel garden, because you will want to have your own version. Um, for example, the east quadrant of your medicine wheel garden will include plants that represent new beginnings or have vibrant green colors. The south quadrant could have plants that symbolize growth and vitality, and the west quadrant might feature plants associated with water elements. The north quadrant could include plants representing wisdom and grounding with earthy tones. 
It's always respectful to learn, of course, from and consult with the teachings and traditions of a specific tribe or community you are engaging with when working with a medicine wheel or any indigenous knowledge through the placement of plants, colors, and symbols associated with each. If, for instance, you're in a, clean, a teaching class, a gardening class, um, or with children creating uh, a medicine wheel garden that could perhaps represent the things that are important to them, uh, also symbolized by the directions of north, south, east, and west, letting them put their small little tokens of their home or things that they appreciate in life and their future or their past. Um, let them decide what is sacred to them. But if you are doing a garden class or something, you may want to be very introspective about what tribe you are representing, or at least including the fact that your area has a specific tribe and you may want to talk about them. So here's how to make a medicine wheel garden. There are two basic medicine wheel garden ideas. The first one is to create a small circular rock outline in the area that has meaning to you. Divide the circle into four parts with stones. Then wait and see what the natural plants around you do when they take root. Traditional herbalists believe that the plants that sow themselves in this sacred garden are what you need most. I would have to debate that because I believe in my yard, probably that would be Creeping Charlie. Um, I don't know that that would be an herb that I would want involved in my medicine wheel and is not, but each to their own. Another medicine wheel garden idea involves the same circle cut into four parts called quadrant formation, <clears throat> but you choose which medicine wheel garden plants will reside within the circle. And that's the way I like it. I like to choose. Each section can be planted with different plants. For example, one or two quadrants might be planted with culinary herbs for your meals. Another with medicinal herbs that you may use like comfrey or uh, herbs that you can use for arthritis, um, pain. I can think of one for that. Um, of course, legally within your area. And each section will be planted with their own uh, specific herb. And yet another with indigenous plants from your area. So I love Queen Anne's Lace. Queen Anne's Lace grows in the ditches in my area. It's a beautiful flat blossom, but looks like white lace. So that would be something that I could plant in my medicine wheel garden and actually did before it took over. <laughs> but so you, may, you have to practice also control of your medicine wheel circle to give it some kind of uh, uh, organization and beauty. And unless you like things wild, and there's many of us that do, you may decide to blend your plantings to incorporate all three and maybe some annual flowers and vegetables too. Well, if you're doing culinary, why not plant a tomato plant? You, you know, with your basil or things that may be in your medicinal or in your culinary section. In your medicinal, you may want to plant some herb or you may want to plant some, um, you know, things that have to do with arthritis or, or with swelling in or to uh, cuts for your children that to heal the, the pain and stop the, um, the flow of blood or whatever. Uh, I'm not in specific knowledge of those 
but I can imagine that those would be some of the herbs you would place in your quadrant of medicinal. In any case, the preparation for a medicine wheel garden is the same. Gather five marker stakes, a hammer, measuring tape, compass, and either string a line for marking. I would say that that is something those that are specifically addicted to straight lines and my medicine wheel garden certainly formed itself. Um, I did make two pathways um, going north and south, east and west between the sections of my medicine wheel garden. I did let my medicine wheel garden um, kind of take its own path for a while. And then it began to be unruly. So I did quite a bit of weed eating. Uh, I am a weed eater. I don't poison. I don't. Uh, and I have way too many gardens to sit down on my butt and pull out each weed. I truly believe that weed eating is the way to go because your earthworms will love you. If they will grow back, you will be able to have um, a very holistic and safe place for your beautiful boundaries done by weed eating without killing the soil. I think dark soil is beautiful, but I don't necessarily feel that it's natural. Very seldom does nature allow black patches of soil. There's always something in it. So, creating a Native American wheel can be an engaging and educational project. The cultural appreciation of making a medicine wheel provides an opportunity for children to learn about and appreciate Native American culture, specifically the spiritual significance of the medicine wheel. It promotes cultural awareness and respect for different belief systems. Hands-on learning. Crafting a medicine wheel involves practical activities such as gathering materials, designing and arranging the wheel's components, and understanding the symbolism behind each of the elements of North, South, East, and West. Kids can delve into the rich history and diverse cultural practices associated with the medicine wheel, explore the significance of different colors, animals, and directions, and learn about the natural elements that are represented in the wheel. Connection to nature. The medicine wheel often symbolizes the interconnectedness between humans and the natural world. Children can gain a deeper appreciation of the environment, learn about different plants, ecosystems, and understand the importance of maintaining a harmonial relationship with nature. Maybe during the process of creating your medicine wheel garden with kids, you could talk about personal growth and reflection, providing an opportunity for this can get kids to contemplate their own values, aspirations, and personal connection to the world around them. It encourages self-expression and fosters a sense of identity and belonging when they're sharing with each other. Community engagement. If you're in a community and you have a garden group or you have people that are connected with herbal stores or, um, you know, holistic things about their shop, this is a great community engagement project. The project can be extended beyond individual learning and become a collaborative effort when the community gets involved. Children can work together, share their findings, and present their medicine wheel to friends, family, or classmates, promoting a sense of unity, 
cultural exchange, and celebration of diversity. Obviously, when it comes to kids, they don't necessarily have to make one. It, it would be nice to have the ability for kids to have the experience of making a nice sized medicine wheel that they could actually sit in. But I can see very clearly that you could also have them create medicine wheels on their um, on construction paper um, with their lines, with rulers, and then uh, making sure that the components of north, south, east, and west are involved. Uh, I, there's so many things a good creative teacher could do with that. Now, I wanted to include something here because I love trees. In fact, I would say the reason that I picked my area for my studio and my home, which are close by, it's a tree tunnel of trees. And it just gives me the most amazing shade. Um, it is something that makes me feel very rooted. And I think the trees carry strong energy of wisdom. So I wanted to add it to this. If you are contemplating planting a wisdom circle of trees, I did have on a piece of land, unfortunately, it was taken in a sheriff's sale because I was kind of fostering it during a time that the taxes were not being paid. So a circle of trees commonly is referred to a wisdom circle and can hold according to people that I have spoken to that were experiencing my wisdom circle, magical and spiritual properties. Especially, I was told, if there is a natural arch in your tree of circles that just seems to open up a place to come in, unity and wholeness. The circular shape of the wisdom circle represents unity, wholeness, and symbolizes the interconnectedness of all life, promoting harmony and balance within the circle of trees it surrounds. Your wisdom circle will have an earth connection. Trees are rooted in the earth, and their presence in a circle emphasizes the connection between the spiritual and natural realms. The circle becomes a conduit of, for channeling earth energy, grounding practitioners, and facilitating a deeper connection with nature. The circular shape allows for the energy to flow continuously, creating a very powerful and concentrated energetic space. The energy can be used for rituals, ceremonies, meditation, or any kind of healing that you want to jumpstart and accelerate, add Reiki, and oh my gosh, there is a meditation for channeling the wisdom of trees. If you are near a tree you especially love, or you are camping and feel the energy of a group of trees or a specific tree, start by finding a quiet space in nature with that tree. You're going to choose the one that you connect with spiritually or feel has a strong, growing, grounding presence. Begin your meditation standing or sitting in front of the tree. Embody the spirit of the tree. Your feet are planted deeply into the ground like roots. And your core is strong like the trunk of a tree. Think of yourself like a tree growing upwards, 
pull your shoulders back and allow yourself to relax. Imagine yourself swaying in the wind like a tree. See a bright, illuminating light from within as your roots are planted deeply into the earth and your branches reach the sky. Find yourself connected to humanity. Send the tree's healing energy, envisioning that sap of coursing through the tree, running through your own veins to all parts of pain within yourself, a loved one, and the world. And when you're done, cross your arms in front of your chest and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This chair.